today because of its earnings season. First, big Australian market leader, biggest weighting in the uh, in the ASX um, in the indexes. Uh, pay a 90 cent US a share interim dividend after booking half year net profit, uh, almost six and a half billion US dollars, 24 percent lower than the previous year, back of lower iron ore prices. Uh, BHP says it booked an underlying net profit of $6.6 billion. Macquarie's, uh, Macquarie says BHP's result was solid with underlying earnings within 1% of its forecast. Um, down around 2% today. Scott, what did you think of the result and BHP shares at these levels? Yeah, Koshi, it's a really difficult one. Um, well, it's, it's not, not hard to see BHP's earnings coming down the pike, right? Because we know the prices, we generally know the volumes. They put our production reports, we know commodity prices. So you kind of, you know, it's kind of almost basic arithmetic at some level. It's why the market's rarely surprised by the time you get to the actual earnings. They've done guidance, we know the volumes, we know the, 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 uh, the prices. So this is kind of, you end up where you end up. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised the market was so... Uh, disappointed given the share price movement today just because again none of this should have been new news and in fact as you've already mentioned they came in you know almost bang on analyst expectations so in that environment you think well what's what's going wrong um it seems to me even though they did reaffirm guidance maybe the market was expecting more we're left to try and guess and wonder why the market might dislike it also news they're selling off a couple of coal mines yep. this is fascinating for uh, investors who are trying to read the tea leaves here because they've got out of the oil business they're selling their, I think they own half of two coal mines in, I think it's Queensland with Mitsubishi. Uh, they're going to sell those. They say they're moving forward to future looking commodities. Whether that's a purely economic decision, whether there's some ESG in there, really hard to know specifically, maybe just straight out governance or, or, or just you know uncertainty when it comes to policy. Uh, but, but hard to really read between the lines of exactly why they're doing what they're doing. What they say is always one thing, whether that's the, the whole truth is an open question. It's not expensive at the moment, mate. It's uh, still under 10 times earnings for BHP if those levels of earnings can be maintained. And I guess, as you know, I'm going to say about commodity companies, yep. you've got to work out whether you think the commodity prices themselves are maintainable or sustainable at the current levels. If they go lower, those PEs can look expensive. If they go higher, the PEs look pretty cheap. It doesn't look expensive to me right now. I'm not a buyer, but I wouldn't rush out and sell it if you owned it for the reasons you probably owned it for. I've said before, if you wanted commodity exposure, I don't think you need it, by the way. But if you did want it, I'd put the old band back together. I'd grab BHP and South32. That gives you really nice diversification across a whole yep. lot of commodities. Um, that's probably the cheats way of doing it because if you are going to do it, you probably have a view on iron or copper or coal or gold or something else. Uh, but for me, again, I wouldn't do it. I haven't got any, uh, I've got Fortescue in my portfolio for a different reason. But if you wanted minerals exposure, commodity exposure, I guess, uh, you know, it, it don't come much better quality wise than yep. the big Australian, uh, but they're not cheap enough to buy. Okay. Mark? Uh, well, a couple of things. Just adding to uh, Scott, Scott's uh, comments, the, the problem, of course, is the uh, commodity price uh, situation going forward. So BHP yeah. and Rio you know, and Fortescue, they've all been doing really, really well, um, as have Whitehaven and Coal. Everybody yeah. in those spaces have been doing well. So, and that's why, and the market's reasonably intelligent about this because the PE is very low because they're, the assumption is that down the road, the commodity prices mm. will be lower because that's what happens. Yeah, they, when uh, supply and demand is out mm. of whack, they do well. Uh, the big question, of course, is China and what China does now going forward. Now, they've opened up and so on. Are they going to continue consuming steel and importing our iron at the same rates they did before? I have no idea. If they do, then BHP is cheap. Yep. If they don't and the prices come right off, then it won't be. Uh, we don't like BHP. Uh, historically, they've been hopeless uh, capital managers right. and they typically invest at the top of the market yeah. uh, usually and pay top dollar. Uh, for things. I remember, I think I've told that story yes. with Chris Ellison yep. before from Min, who said when BHP come knocking at the door, that'll be the time to sell the lithium assets because <laughs> he says they're geniuses at picking the top of the market. Right. That's what right. he said. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so, no, no interest at all. But obviously, right. it's paying a good dividend and uh, it's widely held. Yeah. And There's it's worse a, companies out there. I'm not saying it's yeah, a bad yeah. company, <laughs> it's just that we don't. And it's don't really like, at the top of their five year range. That's what I mean. Top, it's a, does it get any better than this? No. Probably, yeah, yeah. probably not. Okay. Uh, the other one um, I was interested in today to, to get the guide's view on, John's Lean Group uh, has rocketed to its highest level. Look at that, up 16% today, forecasting 11% revenue upgrade, 5.5% uh, EBITDA upgrade on the back of strong earnings. Of course, John's Ling is the builder that works for insurance companies. So they do rectification of uh, insurance claims. They says uh, the earnings upgrade was driven by record volumes of business 
and also revealed its FY23 outlook, expecting a 5.5% jump on the August 2022 forecast. Um, uh, Mark, what do you think of John Slim? Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting business. It's only got five years history, which yeah. is a bit on the light end of things. Yeah. And, and the earnings growth has been uh, about 23% compound since it uh, listed, which is great, but it's yeah. off a zero base. Yeah. So okay. that's only five years. So uh, it's been on a, it's, it's had a lofty PE. I mean, the first year it listed, it was on 29 high and 21 low. And last year it was 90 high and 45 low, and it's currently at 53. This is a right. very, very high PE for a builder. Mm. Uh, also on the fact, if you look at their, um, uh, their uh, the size of the business, they only make about 25 million on on 895 million in uh, revenue. So right. it's not it's not a very substantial business and the net profit margin is only 2.8 and that's come down uh, up to 222. I don't have today's uh, right. numbers in yet. Yeah. So, and the other problem with it is it sort of passes all our filters except for our uh, return on equity and uh, return on capital, which are both sub 10%. Right. But that long term is really a speed limit on what your returns can, can be at a, an equivalent PE. So if I look out five years, if, if a Jane, uh, John's Ling's only got a 7.7% uh, return on capital, I really can't get it better than a 7% return right. uh, at, the, at the same PE. So there's been PE expansion in this as well, which is what's right. making it look so good. Right. Um, but it doesn't pass our filters so on that, so we wouldn't be interested. In it. The 53 PE at the moment, I think, is way too high. That's, it's still showing a 6% return on a margin of safety and 9-10 on a default PE over the next five years. But that default PE is assuming, sorry, that default return is assuming the PE is going to be up at the same sort of level in right. five years, okay. which is, I think, pretty heroic. Okay. Um, Scott, because the sort of the thematic, the story behind John's Ling is when there's yeah. disasters, it benefits more than anybody else. Does, does that hold? Uh, yeah, look, it generally does because they've made... And look, whenever you see a change in industry, when you see an industry consolidating or taking a different path, you want to start paying attention. John's Ling, you know, the, the, the insurers now are using a whole range of subcontractors to basically do the work. You think about the insurance, the, the line of work between the, the actual underwriter, the insurer, the brand owned by the insurer, the subcontractor who does the work, um, you know, that value chain is really worth understanding. And there has been a massive consolidation in the need or the desire um, the opportunity for those insurers to basically bundle up this work and say, I'm going to try and find a subby in every different suburban town across the country. I'm going to subcontract to some of these guys to do some work. Now, I know this firsthand. Now, we're not using John's Ling, but we got a subcontracted uh, construction business trying to fix our flooding from, believe it or not, earlier this year still hasn't been fixed, such as the backlog. That's the, yeah. that's the opportunity, I think, the way this industry is consolidating. And John's Ling, it, that story is exactly that, right? These guys have uh, doubled sales and more than doubled earnings over the past four years, which is extraordinary growth. They've done it basically because they've become more relevant to those insurers. It's not like there's been you know, twice as many uh, insurance claims to deal with or twice as much work per se. It's they've actually made themselves more useful to those insurers. And if you can start to be part of that value chain, there's real upside. Now, that is the upside for this company. A couple of the guys at the pool really like John Sling. Um, I tend to be a little more agnostic, I have to say. Mark's point about the really low margins and the short history is well worth considering. There has been, of course, a lot of natural disasters very recently. If that is the new normal, climate change and everything else, then maybe these guys are off to the races for years and years. If it is just a case of they're growing because they're taking their place in that value chain, and eventually that then falls back to GDP-like growth, then to Mark's point, you don't want to be paying these sort of PEs for this sort of business. It's a low-margin construction business. These are not good quality businesses, generally speaking. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't make money. As that secular change happens, as the insurers use more of these super large subbies, and I guess super large in the context of the industry, it's not a massive business, but in the context of the work they do, there is real upside potential for John's Link. So I wouldn't throw it away, mate. The results today are very, very good and come on the back of, as I said, four years of really strong growth. So uh, if you like it, you understand the business well enough, you understand the industry well enough, I wouldn't necessarily run away from this one. To Mark's point, P of 36 currently, if they double profits, P is still at 18 times, which is you know market leading yeah. uh, in terms of uh, above average. So you want to be a little bit careful there. Um, again, a couple of guys at the full really like John's Link, so I'm hesitant to say you should sell it. I, I'm going to go straight to the middle, mate, call it a hold. Okay. I wouldn't buy it at the moment. I just I, I Basically because I'm not sure how much, for how much longer this level of growth can continue. If it's five years, seven years, you're probably sweet. If it's yeah. two or three years, you probably get left holding a, a sub, sub, sub-par return. Okay. 